Our first reading is from Hebrews 10, verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The second reading is from Romans. Romans 16, verse 17. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that, you are, that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. And the last reading is from Ephesians. Ephesians 4, verse 16. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself in love, as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here this morning, and welcome to church. As usual, we want to uh, celebrate Jesus together. We want to celebrate each other and praise God for his goodness. Now, why we gather, you know, it's an important question. Why do we church? Why do we come together? Why do we worship together? Why do we pray together? And if you look at the scriptures, you'll find so many reasons for this, why we have to come together as a church. Before I go further, let us pray. Let's ask God to just guide us this morning, the Holy Spirit to give me the words, and uh, the Lord will speak to us through his mighty word. Hallelujah. Glorious one, Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to give you worship and praise and glorify your holy name. As your people have gathered here to hear your word, to bless one another, to be empowered, encouraged, to be strengthened in the inner person by the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask, O oh God, we ask, O oh God, that you, O oh Lord, will be pleased with our worship this morning. You'll be pleased with what we offer you. Like the offerings of Abel, that was received, that was pleasant to you. We just want to give you thanks. Accept our offertories of worship and praise. Now, and as we come with a humble heart before your God, I pray, give us the desires of our heart, Psalm 37, 4 and 5. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, why do we gather? Why do you get up every Sunday to come to church? Why, are, why do you church? Church? Why? Why are you here this morning? Let's do some the Q&A, yeah? It's a good place to be. It's a great place to be. Okay, thank you. Others, why are you here this morning? Give thanks to God. Because you love Jesus. To worship God, to be surrounded by love. Yeah. Okay, that's a mouthful. She's she's now talking like a scientist wife. <laughs> it makes sense. That's not right. I'm joking. Okay, others. Why are you here this morning? Yeah. To listen to the word of God. Amen. Okay. 
And now, how many of you are here for the morning tea? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> of course not. Now, how many of you are here because you love someone? And you, you want to see them today morning. And you say, oh, I love this person. I want to see them. I want to see how they're going. Yeah, well, yeah, see your hand over there. Bet, yeah, there's a few hands over there. And how many of you are forced to come? And my, where's my daughter? She'll put up. <laughs> okay, some of us are forced to come, I guess. Now, they're, they're all good reasons. Not the forced to come one, but they're all good reasons. Now, uh, we have a myriad of reasons. Uh, why we come to church, and you have given some very, very good reason why you are here this morning. Uh, and there are other reasons as well. Some say, oh, well, we were married in this church and we have a link. Our children were baptized here, so we are, you know, we come to this church, or we live close by and we come to the church. We got saved here and we stayed. Uh, we are friends and love the community. The people were kind and supportive to us in the time of our crisis or in time of, of need in our life. We saw the power of God manifest in this church, and we have stayed. Um, we like the praise and worship. We love the praise and worship. We love the drums, the guitar, you know, the modern songs we love. And the last one, we like the preaching. <laughs> 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 all right. Now, there are many reasons, all right? There are many reasons. Now, no one comes to church, looks at the flower and said, I am going to stay in this church because of, the, because of these lovely decorations. We don't do that, all right? Or oh, come in and they've got a good mic, mic sound system and you're going to stay before that. It is the people that makes the church. We, we are the church. Now, I want to, to, today I want to briefly share from the scripture, from the text in Hebrews chapter 10, and, and why it is important to gather. Now, I'm going to start from verse 19, the full assurance of faith. Paul is giving us an imagery from the book of Hebrews. He's talking about the Old Testament temple, how it fits in with what we as a church um, um, live as the, today. So Paul is saying, this, was the, this, 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 this is Israel in the Old Testament, but now this is you, the spiritual Israel in the New Testament. So Hebrews is Paul talking about the Old Testament, and he's talking about the temple, the rituals, and then he applies it to the New Testament church. In 1019, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, by the blood of Jesus. Now, when the people gathered for Passover, when they went to the temple, they knew that there's going to be bloody. That means a lot of blood. There'll be blood everywhere. There'll be blood on the floor. There'll be blood on the, uh, the horns of the, the altar. There'll be blood on the priest. There'll be blood on the people. There's blood everywhere. It was not a clean place. You know, it was not like, you know, it, it, it perfumed, clean, and, um, you know, everything is washed. And as you walk in, you see this beautiful marble building. It was not like that. It was like that in the holies of holies. But outside of the temple, outside of the holies of holies, there'd be blood everywhere. As soon as you walk in, you smell blood. You smell blood. As soon as you walk in, you can see red blood everywhere. There's, there's, there's sprinkles of blood. Why? Because as soon as the people walk in, they knew they are before a holy God who will not tolerate sin. But because God is holy and he will not tolerate sin, therefore when they came to the temple, they knew that their guilt conscience or the sinfulness have to be paid for and the blood was shed. It was a constant reminder to the people as soon as they came to the, together as, as, a, as, as Israel, as a nation, blood will be present. And Paul says here, look, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to the, enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, Paul is saying, because of the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, Therefore, we have access to the holies of holies. We have the access to the temple. As Israel gathered 
and sacrifice and shed blood for their sin. So now the blood of Jesus has washed us, cleansed us. So when we gather, we are a sanctified people, cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You're washed, your sins are washed away. You're clean. When you gather, you gather as a sanctified people. And what does it mean for us? By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through the flesh. Paul is saying, we gather because of Jesus. We gather because of what he has done for us. So there is no class, no status when you come and gather before God as people of God. You cannot say, I am special because I've got gifts and talents. I'm special because I'm a millionaire. I'm special because I'm a pop star. You cannot say that because the only reason why we, you are here is true because of the blood of Jesus. It is that, simply that. It is because of the blood of Jesus that have sanctified you and have gathered you. So you say, I'm here because of my own free will, because, you know, I want to be here. This, this is this or that is that. No, brothers and sisters, you are here because by the grace of God, you've been invited into the holy places. Amen? I have been invited. Michael have been invited. Sue have been invited. Lawrence, Elodie have been invited into the holies of holies because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for us. So, as soon as we gather as people, we gather, we leave our class, our status outside. There's no class or status. We come as the redeemed people of God. We are all one. Basically means we are one. We are the same. And then the Bible says, by the new and living word that, that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And this is the high priest that have called us. So there's only one high priest who can intercede for us, the Bible says. And that's Jesus. Now let's move on then to verse 22. The Bible says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So God who draws us, wants us to come near to him, he draws us to, to himself. And how should we draw to God? The Bible says, with full assurance that faith brings. You, when you come to church, you are assured by God that you've been cleansed from your sin. That you're cleansed from all your guilty conscience of the sins of the past. God has cleansed you from your sin, washed, you, washed away your sins. But he also removed that guilty conscience from you. So you, you will not remember the sins of your past. When you come as a redeemed people, you don't think as soon as you enter the church, oh, I, oh 10 years ago I did commit this sin. And you don't come with that guilty conscience. It's gone. It's gone. God has removed it. Now, how many of you still reminisce of your old sins and find them troubling? You suddenly have things, oh yeah, five years ago I committed this sin and it's still there. Whereas the scripture says that guilt conscience is gone through the blood of the Lamb. People often um, accept that their sins are forgiven, but they cannot go of that guilty conscience that keeps grating into their soul, into their spiritual life. The guilty conscience that stays and works like a worm and destroys, makes your spiritual life hollow. Remember the story of Jonah. What did the worm do to this beautiful plant? It went through and ate through, and then the plant died. God sent it to re remind Jonah of, God's, of his, God's mercy and compassion. But the devil is a counterfeit. He's, he counterfeits what God does. And he sends this worm of guilty conscience into your heart, into your soul. So he eats away the goodness it eats away the blessings. Because you're feeling guilty and you live in this guilt and you say, I'm not good, I'm not worthy, I'm not good, I'm not worthy, I'm not... And it eats away your, this, your spiritual, your inner person. 
And that's what the devil does to us. He eats away what's within us and makes us hollow that we cannot be fruitful because we are always reminded of our sins. How many of you got up today morning and suddenly thought about your old sins? Oh, yeah, I committed this sin many years ago. Or this week, and this guilty conscience comes in and the devil works in that, on that and says, see, see, you're a sinner, you're not worthy. Or you might have you know, fallen into the same sin again. See, you never change, the devil tells you. You never change. This is who you are. You will never change. There's nothing you can do. You're going to live in this sin. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says the blood of Jesus removes that guilty conscience. That stain is removed. It is the stain that often troubles Christians. It's not the sin, the stain that stays and, you know, st- and, and, and makes you feel yucky to yourself. And say, oh, I... But the Bible says the blood of Jesus removes that guilty conscience. So, so when you come, number one, all of us are redeemed. We are the same. Number two, you don't come with that guilty conscience. You come with the joy of the liberation that Christ brings into your life. Let's move on. Um, then, the, uh, and as we gather, the Bible, then uh, Paul says, "Let us hold on to the hope we profess, for He who is promised is faithful." When we come, we affirm the unswerving hope in Christ. Now, why, what kind of picture does God draw uh, for us? In the script, from this text in Hebrews is that um, Deuteronomy chapter 20, 21, 20 and 21. God commands the people, he said, hold fast to my commandments. If we can read that. Hold fast to my commandments. Hold on to my word. Don't move to the left or the right. Hold on to the, my words, the commandments I have given you. And the people were supposed to do that. They hold on to the word of God, holding on fast. While the world tries to change them, they hold on fast. God says, you are a holy people for me. God told Israel, you are different. In Ezekiel chapter 33, the people suddenly then got fed up. They said, look, we want to be like the nations. We want to worship gods of idols and stones. We cannot see God, but we can see these idols. We want to become like them. Why can't we do what the nations are doing? We want to become like the nations. Why do we have to do, why do we have to be different? God says, you are my chosen people and I want you to be holy. But I say, no, 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 we do not want to be. We want to be like the rest of them. Church, the spiritual Israel, the world wants us to be like, like the rest of them. You know, like the world. Whatever the world does, if we do, the world will be happy with us. We say, yeah, that's fine. We are all one. But why? The problem is, is that we are different. And we have to be different because you are spiritual Israel. And there will always be tension with the world. Because the Bible also says, love not the world nor the things of the world, Jesus said. Uh, the Bible says, not Jesus, but uh, I think it was in James, do not love the world and the things of the world. Don't become like the world. Same with Israel. God says, don't become like them. Hold on to my word. Hold on to the word, hope that I've given. And we would have cultural clashes because our culture is based on the scripture. It's based on the word of God. You will clash. You will have trouble. You will have trials. And that's why Jesus says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Because you're going to have that constant pressure from the world like Israel did. And Israel fell sometimes, and sometimes they held on firm, but sometimes they joined the world. You and I will have constant pressure to change the way we live because the world does not understand the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. They do not. And you will be tested, and you will be trialed. Let's move on. And then Paul says, and let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds. So redemption, um, redemption, uh, cleanse from, uh, from our sins, our guilty conscience, and then call together 
to a hope in Christ Jesus, which means the doctrine of the scriptures. And then Paul on, goes on to say, let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds. As you come in, the word, the Greek word is fantastic because it, it actually says, how consider, that means you plan, you think thoroughly how you want to help people or encourage people to spur them to love and good deeds. It's not just head off, just turn up and, hey, I want to spur you. No, it is planned. You do it thoughtfully. How can we spur someone to love and good deeds? And when, where does that happen? In the body of Christ. I'll, I'll touch on that later. You spur someone. You think, how can I spur someone to do good deeds and to show love? When you come to church, you say, I worship, we, we have come to worship God. That's, that's, that's the primary reason why we gather. But have you thought, I'm going to get up today and spur someone to love and to good deeds? I'm going to do something good for someone. I'm going to show love to someone in church. Not your friends, your, your, you know, your family, but someone else. I want to show love to them. And that's one of the reasons we gather, to show love to one another. And if someone new comes to our church, and if we don't show love to them, and but we gather among, you know, we, we gather with our familiar friends, the ones we are with all the time, and neglect the new person, how are we showing love and spurring that person to good deeds? If you sit in the same seat all the time and you get annoyed when someone sits in your seat, <laughs> how are we showing love and spurring one another to good deeds? My, my friend, a pastor, he told me once, he said, you know, in, in some, some Anglican church, the kitchen is more sacred than the, than the church itself. <laughs> so he said he went to, when he was a new pastor, he went to a, a church and the ladies told him, the kitchen ladies told him, you can go everywhere except the kitchen. He said, why? He said, oh no, you cannot come to the, we, we control the kitchen. So then he, he and, and, and all the cupboards were locked. Okay, they locked it. All the cupboards, he said, open it, let people use the plate. No, no, cannot. There's one person who handles this, and you, even the, pre, the pastor did not have access to the cupboards. So one day he got very upset. He said, what is this? So he broke open the lock and bro broke all the plates. And he said, this has become an idol in this church, and therefore we need to destroy this. You know, people were like, this is mine, do not touch it, or well, there'll be blood on the floor. <laughs> this is mine, I want to hold on to this. You can change anything, but don't touch this. And you think, is that scriptural? Is that from the Lord? Or is that pride? So going back to my first point, why we gather? Because you want to hold on to something? and you think that belongs to you, then you fail to understand what redemption means. What sanctification means. What redemption to the blood of Jesus means. You don't hold on and say, this is mine, don't touch. You will die, man. You don't. No, you don't. We, we are here, as I said, through the blood of Christ. So how can we spur one another? How many churches have gone and you don't feel any spurring, but rather you felt that people are judging you? That people are looking at you and saying, oh, the... people are judging you because of the clothes that you wear. How many churches you've been to where people don't even greet you? They ignore you. They don't even offer you a cup of tea or coffee. That church has failed. That is ch church has failed to be a church. Because what, what Paul, Paul, God asks us to do in Hebrews is to spur one another to good deeds and love. The first thing when people come to our church is they must sense that love of God's people, isn't it? That we are God's people. You must sense that love. And if you don't feel loved, if you don't feel welcome, don't stay in the church. Simple as that. Don't feel, if, you, if people are not welcoming you, they're not showing love to you, it's not caring, why do you want to stay in the church? 
You can say, oh, I just want to worship God. No, you can't worship God if the people don't represent Christ's love. They don't show Christ's love to you. Then you'll be like a ritual. You come every Sunday morning. Oh, yeah, I got communion. I pray, then I go. You know, you know someday, sometimes we think, oh, yeah, I'm going to church. I'm going to pray. I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm just going to pray. I'm going to take the communion. I'm going to go off. I've done my duty. Then you fail to understand church. That's not church. That's not church. You, you, you become ritualistic. Church is spurring one another in loving one another in praying for one another. I'll touch on that later. All right, let's move on. And then Paul says, and let us consider, okay, done? Not giving up meeting together. And Paul then, you know, Paul's way of teaching is that he slowly builds and builds and builds, and then bam, he gives a counter, you know, that killer punch, as I say. And then he goes and gives this killer punch and says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Paul said, I'm troubled by this. Some people got in the habit of not coming to church. They've deserted. The Greek word is actually deserted the church. I mean, they're not connected anymore to the church. They feel alienated from the church. Church meaning the people. I'm talking about the people. It's interesting, isn't it? Going back to the point I made, we come to church. Some people come to church because they hold on to a ritual. They hold on to something that they think historically belong to them. And all those are bad reasons for being in a church. You are in a church because you love one another and you've connected with the people. Yeah? So Paul says some people are habit of not coming together. And he says the day is coming, but what are you doing? You have deserted the gathering. You have deserted. You say, no, I don't want to come to church. Or I can worship by myself. Or I can watch the internet. I can watch from Billy Graham to Derek Prince. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm being fulfilled. I'm being blessed. And that's all I need. Why do I need people? Well, friend, then you don't get church. You don't understand church. It's not watching TV uh, on TV, Billy Graham. That's not churching. Sorry. It is the people. If you are not with people, if you are not spurring, you are not doing spurring people to good deed and worshiping together as a people of God, you, you have missed the point of being a church. Go back to the, 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 the Jewish people. They did an annual year walk to the temple to worship God. Why did they do it? They could worship it at, at home. They could say, yeah, I don't want to go. I can... No, because God commanded them to come together as a nation to worship him. You and I, you we have a duty and obligation to the Lord Jesus Christ as redeemed to come together to worship and to spur one another to good deeds and love. If you don't come to church and you're going to sit, if you're sitting at your couch and listening to the sermon and uh, flicking to the YouTube channel and saying, yeah, that's church, well, you don't get church then. I understand the COVID, you know, shut us down. We, I'm glad, I, I hope you have met through Zoom and other means. Yeah, we, you did. Thank you. Praise the Lord for that. Do you still want a church? You still want that connection. It is important to make that connection. And if you don't get that connection, then you go and look for a new church and say, I'm not connecting. I'm just coming. I've become ritualistic. I've got no love. I'm not spurring another for good deeds. Well, then find another church where you cannot connect and spur one another to good deeds. Yeah? Or you are saying, I'm having trouble with this. I need to talk to the pastor or leaders. How can I, you know, overcome this? Then we are here to support you and te te teach you how you can overcome the obstacles and move on. But you cannot desert the church. You cannot say, oh yeah, I don't want to have anything to the church. I'm going to sit at home and uh, pray and worship by myself. That's not church. That means you have not attended church. Let's move on then to uh, the second text. Uh, we'll go quickly uh, through the second and the third text. This, uh, this, the, sorry, the third text, I think. Uh, can I have um, Ephesians 4, please? We'll go to Romans later. Can I have Ephesians 4? Uh, Ephesians, the last one. Ephesians 4, yeah, the last one. The next, yeah, that's one. Thank you. Now, 
the Bible says, for him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as much as, as each part does its work. Now, having looked at all this, I want to, to look at this verse. Now, we all know we are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Yes, you are the bride, you are the body of Christ. Now, as a body, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds, or again, love, as each part does its work. What's the last, uh, last line? Uh, read together with me. As each part does its work. Again, again. As each part does its work. So when you are gathered as a body of Christ, God wants you to do the part, you are the part, do your work in the body. You have an obligation before the Redeemer Jesus Christ to do your part in the body of Christ. So it is not only about receiving, but it's also about giving. You have a role in the body of Christ. Let's say, one morning, this is me, this is my body, I'm, I'm six feet, uh, I think 183 centimeters, or six feet um, tall, and one day I get up in the morning and my hand, let's say my different parts of my body can, can talk or can speak, okay? And one day when I get up in the morning, my hand says to me, Richard, I'm going to slap you 50 times a day. And I say, my hand, do not do it. And I say, no, I'm going to just keep slapping. All right. One day I get up in the morning and my, in my uh, let's say my left foot says, Richard, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go and stand in the middle of the road. I said, no, no, don't do that. You're going to hurt the rest of me. No, I'm, I don't care. Or let's say my uh, ears tell me, get up in the one morning and say, Richard, we're going to block both your ears. We are not going to listen to anything. Or my, my lips tell me, I'm going to shut, I'm going to sew my, my lips uh, together. I'm not going to open it anymore for you. Or one day my heart says, that's it, I'm stop, going to stop beating for the next 24 hours. That's it, that's the end of Richard. Isn't it? Isn't it? But how come in the church, you have been called to be part of the church, who have been gifted and talented, can say to the body, no, no, I don't want to serve. I've got gifts and no, I don't want to do it. So how can the church grow? How can the body grow? The three, the, 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 there's the five of us are doing, the, let's say the arm is faithfully serving the Lord, but the feet don't want to come along. And say, no, no. Your years are not coming along. Your, 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 uh, your, your, your lips are not coming along. They are fighting, you know, causing division. How is the body going to grow? Have you seen a church that's divided grow? Where there's a lot of bickering and fighting and gossiping? As you, have you seen such a church grow? Can I have the the verses verse before before uh, from Romans, please? The Romans verse. Romans, yeah. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause division and obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. If you put obstacles, if you put if if it's contrary to the teaching that you have learned, Paul says, keep away from them. Imagine. A church that is divided, that is strayed away from the doctrine of the word of God. How will the church survive? How will the church grow? How can the church grow if the members are not involved in growing the church? If they don't do their part, they don't come together, don't use your gifts and talents. And all you say, yes, I'm a Christian, I come to church, but I'm not going to be get involved. 
Oh, no, no, don't call upon me. Don't, I'm not getting involved. But, friends, that's not an option. It is a commandment that we must be involved in the church. We are the body. God has given you gifts and talents because God knows that you will be useful for the body of Christ. How can you say, no, I do not want to give? Let others do it. Let others do whatever they want. But I'm not going to be. Then are you dis- you, aren't you disobeying God's commandment? Was called you to be part of the body of Christ. One day I went to a church and I met this pastor, again, different pastor, and he and everyone came inside the church and everyone sat down and they were chatting with their friends. And I thought, oh, I need to do something. Let me be useful. I went outside the, 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 the main door and I greeted people and welcomed them. I said, Good morning, good to see you. Well, come to church, give me your names. And, you know, I just spontaneously did that. Um, and the pastor came along and he said, thank you very much for doing this. He said, when people come to the church, he said, most of them will just chat with their friends and often ignore the new people. He said, thank you so much for doing it. What I saw, I saw a need, I did it. I said, look, if I can do it, I saw a need, I do it. How many times have you seen a need and you said, look, no, not me, not me. I don't, I don't want to do it. But God, the Spirit is saying, hey, can you do it? And he said, no, there's too much trouble. I don't want to get involved. How many times you have backed away and lost the blessing? How many times you have stopped doing, stopped using your gifts and talents for, for, for the body of Christ and the body of suffers? How many times you've been fearful and said, oh, I do not want to say this word, maybe I'm wrong, and the body has suffered. I remember Jenny, came, Jenny Bernard coming to me one day and saying, Richard, I don't know what, what you know, she said, I, it might be, say, I think you said silly or strange, but I just want to say something to you, she said. And I said, what is it, Jenny? And she said, oh, you know, I think she was apprehensive, said, this is the silliest thing you can say to a pastor. And he said, you know, God said you are like Richard the Lionheart. And I, I looked at her and she was like, oh, this must be the silliest thing I ever said to a pastor. Who knows? Guy from Asia is talking about Richard the Lionheart. But what Jenny didn't know was that uh, my father went to, uh, many years ago, he saw Richard Burton, Richard the Lionheart. It was a movie. And he thought, that, oh, that's a very nice name. And he actually named me after Richard the Lionheart. And no, and I haven't shared this with Jenny or anyone here, but the Lord knew. The Lord knew. And I was really touched. I said, the Lord remembers this, you know, this, this kind of information. How much he cares for you. How much does the Lord care for you? Friends, God has called you. God has called you. God knows you. Use your gifts and talents. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. This is the reason we gather. We gather to worship. We gather to spur one another. We gather so you and I may go, do, spur one another to love and good deeds. We are not gathered. We, God did not gather us so that we can cause divisions and lay obstacles or teach the doctrine of the devil. God isn't called this. So God has called you. Now I want to make this point again, affirm this point. I want to say this to you. I know there are weaknesses in our body when we struggle with our own weaknesses. But that's not a problem to God. That's not a problem at all to God. Isn't it? Just because you have weakness doesn't mean it's a huge problem to God. God says, I'm sovereign. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm almighty. I'm powerful. I know how to use you. You just surrender to me and I'll take care of it. That's why we gather. Redeemed. Washed in the blood of Jesus. Worshipping the Lord. Spurring one another to good love and good deeds. I want to pray. And as we pray this morning. And I pray that those who have been sort of sitting on the fence and thinking, oh, shall I commit to this or that? 
uh, to the calling that God has placed on your life, that you will make a decision today. And I pray for those who are struggling this morning with weaknesses and saying, Lord, I want to do these things for you. I want to, yes, I want to move forward, but Lord, you know my condition. You know my sicknesses. You know my, what I'm going through. You know my family. You know my turmoils in my family, the, tr the trials that I'm facing. You know the temptations that I face, my sinfulness. Well, God can deal with that too. God will make a way for you. Hallelujah. So let's pray hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God knows your heart, and I pray God is, will give us the spirit of discernment this morning, a spirit of revelation to speak to you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.